This episode is brought to you by the problem of the day over at Biocord. Become a member of the world's best life sciences community today by visiting discord.gg biology. One of my favorite things about life on Earth is that it is absolutely everywhere. Volcanic vents? Check. The crushingly impossible depths of the ocean? You bet. Literally floating in droplets thousands of feet in the air? You know it. The Tree of Life is all about adaptation. Life grows and adapts and iterates across eons, which gives it a pretty solid chance of surviving just about anywhere if you give some biological system a few millennia to figure out a new circumstance. Pretty much the only requirement for life on Earth to be alive is liquid water. The fluid in your cells needs to be liquid in order to carry out the chemistry of being alive. Which is crazy considering there are huge swaths of the Earth that are completely frozen right now as you watch this video. Or are about to freeze, or freeze periodically enough that it becomes problematic for being alive. Now, big ol' mammals like you and me can adapt to places like this. We have a way of staying warm so our insides stay squishy and chemically viable pretty much at all times. But animals like us, we don't sustain an ecosystem. We just hang out at the top of the food chain. How can the smallest living things, you know, like the ones that are unicellular or unable to shiver or cold-blooded or whatever, stay above freezing and keep about the business of living in these frozen environments? Today, let's look at a chemical adaptation that keeps the polar region's smallest and most important residents alive. We're going to be talking about ice structuring proteins and how they hug ice crystals to death, y'all. Life is best explored at the molecular level. Subscribe to this channel to join me as we uncover all the weird and wonderful ways life just works at its smallest scale. Anyway, so it takes a lot of adaptation and effort to survive up in these polar regions. For animals that haven't unlocked being warm-blooded, every advantage helps. A lot of these top-level adaptations have been covered extensively both in papers as well as on other YouTube channels. I have a thread of sources and supplementary materials over at my Twitter. Go ahead and check it out at, at this underscore clockwork, or check for a link in the description here. Before we talk about how to prevent water from freezing, let's dip back into physical chemistry real fast and see how water freezes at all. In a lot of my videos, I go into how weird water is. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. That weirdness hits its peak when water freezes. Remember, each water molecule is like a tiny little magnet with a positive end and a negative end. Liquid water sticks and unsticks to itself as it moves around all the time. But when water freezes, that becomes permanent in a really specific shape. Water crystallizes in little hexagons like this, with a lot of space in the center of each hexagon. This is why ice is less dense than water and icebergs float and all that, but I'm getting distracted. The important thing to know here is, water doesn't freeze all at once into one giant crystal. When water starts to freeze, a bunch of tiny crystals form all over the place and start growing. It's a gradual process even at its fastest, but no matter what, the crystals need to grow to complete the freezing process. And this is where we can disrupt making ice. Now, the most common way to keep these crystals from getting big enough to freeze solid is just to add a bunch of dissolved stuff in the water to prevent it from sticking together. This is kind of why salt works to de-ice roads. But a better analogy for life is ice cream. All the sugar and fat in that mixture helps keep the ice crystals small so it never becomes one big solid crystal, hence that texture. So for some animals, right at the freezing point you're going to see them dump just a bucket of glucose into their fluids to keep freezing from being catastrophic. Now real quick, freezing is only catastrophic for living things if these crystals can A. Puncture the membrane of some living thing's cells and kill it to death, or B. Take up enough space to stop chemistry from happening. The problem with just shoving a bunch of sugar and salt and whatever into the fluid inside a living thing is, it kinda makes option B happen regardless. So here's the evolutionary pressure. Living things need a way to keep ice crystals small without completely messing up the balance of dissolved stuff in their cytoplasm and intracellular fluid. So what did evolution come up with? Well check this out. This is a completely nuts class of proteins called antifreeze proteins, or more recently known as ice structuring proteins, or if you're getting real fancy, ice restructuring proteins. I don't know man, I'm not a scientist, I'm not the one making up the names here. These incredible nubs can stop ice in its tracks with an incredibly small amount of mass, with a concentration up to a hundred times less than the sugar method. So how do they pull this off? It's actually kind of wild and hard to tell from this angle, but from the side you've got the single ice binding site over here, and then you've just got a regular peptide backbone giving it a little structure over here. It's kind of hard to see what the big deal is from this angle, 
All I want you to do right now is keep in mind these little bumps on the ice binding site before we rotate around to the front of this protein. And you'll see from this angle, looking straight down at the ice binding site, how flat this is. The ice binding site is primarily made up of a secondary structure called beta pleated sheets which are great in proteins for a lot of more geometric structures. They can make like little barrels and lots of other stuff. Here, they flatten out the side that actually will touch ice. But yeah, like, what's that flatness going to do to stop ice? Well, here's where it gets weirder. It's not just the flatness, it's what these flat sheets are made of. Now, this isn't the case for every single ice structuring protein, just the one I'm showing you, but this particular one is made up of a bunch of alanine amino acids, with the alanine functional group sticking out. Now it gets goofy, because alanine is a hydrophobic amino acid. Hydrophobic in the same way oil is. Anything with enough alanine on it will actively repel water. Which should give you pause, because, like... If ice is made of water, how is this going to be the site that binds to ice? I know, right? I love this part. Let's go back to the moment these ice crystals start forming, only let's add a few of these proteins to the mix. These proteins are hanging out with one side desperately seeking any place to keep their face away from liquid water. And so that action eventually leads them to bump into this ice crystal, with the face away from the liquid and towards the solid. Hydrophobic forces aren't as strong for solid water, and this is where those bumps on the face of the ice binding side finally make sense, because if you zoom in on here, look, they're the perfect shape to fit those little hexagonal ice crystals. The theory here is that this fit is so snug that even smaller molecular forces can take over and cancel out the hydrophobic nature of the alanine. Van der Waals interactions cement this bond, and this protein is essentially fused to the face of the crystal which keeps that crystal from growing anymore. If liquid water molecules can't touch this solid crystal, then it's game over. The crystal just won't grow anymore. It literally blocks the growth by just getting in the way. So in aggregate, all of these proteins bind to the little ice crystal and keep them from getting large enough to fully freeze water. For some really powerful classes of ice structuring proteins, this can drop water's freezing point as much as 6 degrees. It is a small edge, but life can use any nanoscale advantage to make huge wins. These proteins allow diatoms and bacteria to enter frozen areas with less competition. Those same proteins are used by plankton and fish to feed on those organisms in the Arctic. Without ice structuring proteins, the entire ecosystem in these polar regions would have zero foundation. This little edge helped make everything from elk to penguins even possible. Life is all about these little advantages, and proteins can be extremely clever in how they deliver those little bits of leverage that help future generations grow and thrive, no matter what this world throws at them. It's these tiny little improvements that eventually build you, and I'm real excited to see what we increment on top of that. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. The inspiration for this video was lifted directly from the problem of the day over at the Biochord server over on Discord. Biochord is the most incredible community for life science enthusiasts, students, and professionals that I know about on the internet. It's a great place to chat and share and commiserate with fellow life sciences nerds like me, and I'm very excited to partner up with them. You have everything from multidisciplinary lectures, to problems of the day to constantly hone your skills, like the one that inspired this video, or even specific spaces where specific niches of life sciences folk can hang out, talk, and share ideas. It's literally my favorite place on the internet, and I really think you should join. Check a link in the description to join Biocord, or just feel free to check them out at discord.gg biology. Meanwhile, thanks so much for getting to the end of this video. If you liked this, I would really strongly encourage you to subscribe. At the same time, if you want to help keep these videos coming out regularly, feel free to support me over at patreon.com slash clockworkshow. Furthermore, this was a very quick video because I've got a real stunner coming out next month, but I wanted to make sure I got this one out anyway. There's so much more to explore when you think about ice structuring proteins, and I have a really in-depth thread about all of my sources as well as supplementary materials over at my Twitter, which you can find at at this underscore clockwork. Link in the description as well to the actual thread for sources. Either way, thank you so much for getting all the way to the end here, and as always, I like to leave you with peace, love, and alanine residues. Everyone be well, thank you so much.